Another Liquid Bullet Productions. Uh, joining me today is a former associate with the Essex Boys, uh, Michael Kelly. Thank Thanks you. For coming, Michael. Glad to be here. How you been today, all right? Yeah, good, good. Yeah, good. So, um, a little bit of an interesting story and a bit of an interesting connection. It was, the, it was just the times. 88 to 2008 it was just the crazy years of door work back when there were no cameras, yep. no licensing, no rules. You made up your own rules. Before we jump straight into it, can I just roll back to the beginning and get a bit of history of, of yourself, or where you was born, where you grew up? Well, I was born in a small town in Tipperary called Templemore. Um, average Irish town, grew up, no TVs really, so we're always out on the street. You end up fighting with the next town, the next village. So that was sort of my weekly entertainment for, <laughs> yeah till I was about 20 21 um, and then I met a girl that was teaching in my town and went to France followed her from there I came to England I had a job offer over here and I wanted to try my hand at fighting and that so um, that's what brought me to London so originally then started working on the doors down in uh, London for Stringfellow on, on White's door. I was only a kid. Uh, Lenny was there at the time. Uh, Big Lenny McLean. Yeah, but not on White's. He was on the other door. Stringfield had three clubs. Oh, wow. Well. Yeah. Um, so you just, yeah, I'd rotate. The kids would rotate, the young guys, you know. Um, and that was a wild introduction because when you work in central London, there's never a steady audience for the club. So they'd come in bus loads and they didn't care if they were barred, so they didn't mind fighting. So you'd be out fighting in the middle of the street. <laughs> Um, famously Lenny was involved where a guy died and he got arrested for that so it was chaotic times you know um, he was uh, an interesting character very intense but I had nothing bad to say about him he looked after us well you know as kids and he would teach us a little bit not a lot but at <laughs> least he, he looked out for us you know yeah, yeah. had your back he had your back which is all you wanted really you know yeah you know, every character's not the same. They're not all talkative, you know. Then he yeah. wasn't a big talker, uh, unless he was involved in a fight, you know. He was a big talker then, but otherwise he was a quiet man. And uh, then I moved. I couldn't afford a car when I first came, so I had to get trains. And then I'd missed the train working late in London, so I eventually got moved up to a barnet. And then I, he was my first real head doorman, a guy called Bob Meyer, fantastic guy, ex Marine. He actually taught me how to do it because all I all I needed to do was fight. So when someone said something to himself, the hand would come. Anyone come up, give you crap. I wouldn't wait. I wouldn't talk him down. It would be listen, mate, and it's it was over. And then he was the one that said, "Look, you can't fight everybody. You know, just because someone insults you doesn't mean they mean it. They could be insulting you and walking backwards. They could be just saying it to impress the girlfriend." So I learned all those things and it was, it was a good education. And from there then, the manager of, of the pub that I was in became manager of uh, Hollywoods in Romford. And that's the first time I even stepped foot in Essex. And it was a big eye opener because I worked in, in Hertfordshire where everyone's posh, they're all the horsey crowd. <laughs> everyone's polite to come in and shake your hand, you know, no hugging and anything. Then I go to Essex and everyone's screaming at you, go on geezer! You know, it's like, what is this? But I loved it. I loved every minute of every day there. 
and there was a lot of chaotic days, you know. How many guys was on the team of Hollywood? So Twelve. Twelve teams. Uh, I came with a friend of mine, Neville, uh, also from my hometown, with the manager and the other ten, I think about six of them came from South End. Uh, a guy called John King had the contract and he went around and picked Dorman. So there was uh, Lee Chapman, Big Lee, uh, Steve Luke, um, Andy Williams was the head Dorman, uh, Cliff Good and of course Gary Mott. And then there was a few from just the local area around for you know, Roger, Dave, Pierre. Yeah, it was a good, strong team. And they were hand-picked back before licenses, you know, when you had, this was like, I never seen a club like this. It was the first, it was the first club that was built exclusively as a nightclub, it, as opposed to all the other clubs were old, ballrooms of romance that were changed around yeah. to do it. But this was actually purposely built by, by an architect, an Italian architect. So all the bottom floor surrounded, all the bars were built around the dance floor you walked on, which floated, surrounded. You walked in the reception, and you, there was a receptionist, and behind there was a waterfall. Either side was this, a waterfall, that came down into a pond with fish, a kid or not. <laughs> like it was the excess, way of doing things in Essex in the 80s was just a, a joy to behold, you know. Like there was nothing they couldn't do or try, you know. I loved that place. But it was a violent place. We were there only the very first week when Roy Shaw came down. With a, uh, on the first night he came down and the police told us this guy may turn up here and we're not to allow him in. But none of us knew who he was. Yeah. All the boys were from South End, we were from North London. We weren't from East London. So he got in. And he got into the VIP, and at the end of the night, when it was time to go, and one of the doormen tapped him on the back, he jumped up with a glass in his hand and threatened him, you know. And the management panicked. Like they had, in this VIP, they had a full grand piano with a, a guy in a suit playing it, you know. All, all the women. It's like something out of 1920s Hollywood. They <laughs> built it that way. And uh, they didn't want any trouble, so they just let it go and bar him after that. So I think he knew because the following week then he came down with about 15 guys, you know, all car dealers. He was a car dealer. So he always had these hangers on. And uh, they were knocked back. But the problem was we had all glass doors from one side to the other, just pure glass doors. So when we wouldn't let him in, they started banging on the doors and looking at us and threatening us and making gun signs and we're going to kill you and all of this. So we were getting edgy because the management had come down and said, under no circumstances go out there. But you can't do that to Dorman. We're getting abused. And yeah. I remember my hands were like this. Also, it makes you look like you're sort of scared of them, doesn't it? By, yeah. By oh, well, they, they also thought that. Yeah. So they, they got worse. So like we were like this. But Lee was on the door. It was very funny. And the glass, what, how glass doors operated, because you have no locks. You have a latch on the bottom, latch on the top. We always had the latch on the bottom off and the latch on the top on. So he just opened it to let people in and close it and all this. And I saw Lee, as they were shouting around, slowly, slowly click down the thing. And I thought, it's now open. And he put his hand back in the door and he just looked, that was enough. We went, we gotta go here, you know. And we're starting to ignore. So we just screamed at the manager, we're going, you know, the, the hell if we get sacked. And we piled out the door. And Lee hit Shaw clean front, lifted him up in the air and came down on top of him. And we just obliterated all in front of us. And uh, the funny thing was there was three police vans watching it. And they turned on and drove off. Really? Yeah, That's they did a tour of the town, as they said, and came yeah. back 20 minutes later. Um, That's nice of him, yeah. Yeah, well, they hated him. You know, they hated him and they hated his crew. And I don't know if you remember Harry Enfield, loads of money. Oh, yeah, yeah. But they got that from Essex. That was a thing. They used to come in balls of what? In, in, wrapped in, in... It was just embarrassing, you know, to be waving around champagne, this, you know. One of, them, one of his friends that I didn't like, he had two Greek brothers that used to come. And he made a big deal of telling me his watch was more than I'd earn in the year, you know, and you're nothing. You know. So, yeah, we were... We were well prepared, like to just meet out. And once we saw the police go, there was no holding back. And Shaw was dangerous, so 
he had to deal with him and he dealt with him. My God, he broke him up. So an ambulance then, three ambulances came and took them away. The police never questioned us, nothing. They just, everything all right? Yep. And at 4 a.m., we finished the night, because this was about 12 o'clock. We finished the night at 2, had a drink afterwards to talk about it. We were gone out there by 3. Shaw arrives back at half four in the morning, unconscious. He, he was unconscious and he let himself out of hospital. He came back with a hammer or something he got from his house. I don't know what he, he... They found him hiding behind the bins. He thought we were still in there. He was delirious. Uh, so the follow-up to that, of course, is... So who, who was it found him? Found him there? The police. The police found him. Yeah, someone must have said he was down hanging yeah. around. And, uh, see, we, we, yeah, we had an all-night bus station there, right yeah. opposite. So I would imagine the bus drivers were looking at him thinking, what's going on here, you know? Because um, he had a big bandage on his head. So it wasn't... Bump. <laughs> yeah, it, it wasn't hard to find him. And then, of course, I didn't know, but I now know and I'm well aware of is this, this Essex thing of, like, Oh, you're going to be salted, son. This, this, this thing, you know, this ain't going to be let go, you know. Ooh. The rumors started going, you know. And there was going to be hundreds coming back and they want to shoot this. So we decided, you know, we can't wait for this. We might as well deal with it head on. So we went over to the Brewery Tap, which was the ground central for gangsters in East London at the time. What was that called again, sorry? The Brewery Tap in Barking. Brewery. Yeah, oh, rough as they come now. And we went in. I think there was about 25 of us went in and we locked all the doors and just started roaring, looking for Shaw and basically terrorising the place without doing anything to terrorise the place, just to let him know that we're looking for him and to stop anyone joining him. And that was the end of it. We never heard no more after that. Um, I, I detested Shaw. I thought he was a nasty, bullying scrote. Um, two years later, I, like, I had a fight with him myself down in secret. You know, he just... No matter how old he got, he wouldn't stop. He just, he wasn't right. You know, for Lenny, for all the people, I know Lenny, they say Lenny was an angry man, he was a bully and everything else. He bullied people that could and should have been bullied. That's the difference. Shaw, in his own book, describes how he glassed a guy who looked at his wife out of the corporate boxing event, you know. I, I know what I call a nobody, you know. Yeah. You can beat those guys up every day of the week. You can, you can pad your record, as you say, with all these people. It, it doesn't mean anything, but that's the difference between the two of them. He was, he was declared insane yeah. in, when, he was, when he went to uh, jail. Um, he was in Broadmoor, sure. I mean, that was from the criminally insane. So, yeah, he, he wasn't wired right. And you could see it in him. He had wild eyes, and he, his brain, every time he thought, his eyes would go. And he didn't know what was coming next. So there was, they were right. The manager were dead right. You couldn't have a guy like that in a club, because one night he'd be happy as Larry, and the next it's minute, no. It's unpredictable. Yeah. Walking time, bomb, isn't it? Yeah. But uh, yeah, it continued. No, oh, there was some a lot of fun nights too, you know, and crazy nights. I mean, it was the eighties. Bouffant hair, XR three eyes, <laughs> yeah. and lycra dresses. You know, what's what's not to like? And everyone was. The one thing I loved about Essex is they're, they're always on the make and there's all, they're always you know wheeling and dealing and they're always buzzing and they're always up um, I'd never come across that before you know uh, so yeah it was, it, was, it was a hell of a place but it was back when the days you couldn't do stuff now like you miss wet t-shirts and yeah it's all gone you know politically correct now. yeah our first birthday they had a page three girl burst out of a cake and Lee picked her up and all you know Politically correct, you couldn't do it today, you know. Yeah. But it, that's that was the times. So, so when did you actually meet? Did you meet Tony Tucker at this? From day one. Hollywood? From day one, you mean? Yeah. What we did was on a Monday. The, it opened in April '87, and I think the previous week we had to go down in the daytime for a sort of a, an orientation with Bill Murray, and John King, the management, and. We didn't know anybody. We just sat there, you know, asking a few questions about how we're getting paid and whatever, you know. And this is where you sort of introduce each other. And we didn't, I didn't even know where South End was, never heard of it. These guys are from South End. Well, well great. Um, 
I remember seeing Chapman for the first time and it was like, Neville said to me, we got to get back into the gym. Like I was 16 and a half stone, I thought I was big. Um, you see a man at 24 stone and he moves as quick as he did. I, I, I couldn't comprehend it, you know. Um, Tucker, yeah, Tucker, the difference between Tucker and the rest of them was Tucker was vain. He was a good looking fella, he knew it, the girls liked him, he loved his hair and it's been mocked mercilessly for the last 30 years, but he didn't have the hair that Terry Stone has in, in, in the films, you know? And he didn't, I'd like to clarify this now for me. Tucker came from an upper middle class family. He spoke well, he spoke quietly, he, he thought a lot. He wasn't wild and reckless. Terry Stone is playing himself. Terry Stone, that's the way he speaks. He's from London, he curses a lot, he's animated. Tony was none of those things. He was very deliberate, too deliberate sometimes. He could be sneaky and everything else. He'd set guys against each other. But in general, he was, he was a good guy, you know. Uh, we had fun. Um, every Monday we went to Tots and South End because that was everyone's day off. So all the door staff and all the bar staff around Essex used to go there, you know. And he'd be the first to go. He'd always, he was always up for a party. Like. It was just, we went on years and years, and then Andy Williams left when they opened Ipswich, Hollywood's in Ipswich, they bought a second club. And I was head door, I've made head doorman then. And about a year after that, Zen's in Dartford opened, and the director of Hollywood's built this himself or bought this himself. He wanted to go out on his own. And the, the owners of Hollywood didn't like that. And so they gave the security company the choice, you know. You can't work here and work Zen's. So they they gave it up. And I assumed I'd get it. I was head dormant, I was running the show. It was now two years in, I had it the way I wanted it. The club was the way I wanted, the dormant worked for me the way I wanted. No more wildness, it had calmed down. But I had that Irish naivety in me. I assumed they'd just give it to me. I didn't have to ask. I just waited and waited and it didn't happen. It transpired that um, Tony Tucker was taking the new director out horse riding and for dinner and whatever, meals down in London, all of this sort of thing. And I got called up to the office by the new director and there was Tony standing beside him. And he said to me, you're doing a fabulous job. We want to keep you here, Mick, but we're giving the contract to Tony. We'd like you to work together, you know. And Tony said, yeah, Mick, we're going, you know, we're going to rock this. And I'm going. And I remember looking at the, the letter opener, the stiletto opener, and I was thinking, I'm going to stick this right through his forehead now in a minute. I was, just, I was stunned. And I was stunned that, not at him. I didn't care about him. I didn't even know the guy. But Tucker had worked for two years, had done it. And he'd done it so coldly, yeah. I thought. And, and I didn't see it coming because we were all friends and, you know, yeah. you look after your friends and you have you're your back. You're in the back door. We had over a hundred fights at this stage in Hollywood, so now each had her own back. Um, there was one night there, Lee was on the dance floor, it was packed, we had over 2,000 in and I was positioned on the stairs. This is before I became head drawn. And this row got out and Lee went over to grab the two of them. But I could see guys moving in behind him. So I went to go, run to go with him and the stairs was packed. I couldn't move and I thought, I won't get there. And like an idiot, I climbed up on the, the railings on the stairs. And I thought, I can jump there. It's just there. It's right underneath me. I can make it. And I did. I got up on the railings. And then went, just as I was going, I thought, Oh boy, you made a mistake here. And I landed on the guy and he couldn't support me. He just hit the floor. And I went down and my arm just went <laughs> And uh, Lee was laughing. The other doorman came over. They all started laughing. I was like, what's that? Your man is flat. I said, take him, take him. <laughs> they helped me down the stairs. I thought it broke my arm. I went to the hospital. It wasn't, it was just a massive bruise. You had chaos like this. We had people fall off the balconies, drunk. Really? They'd sit up on it. And then they lean back, they forget themselves, lean back. We'd always be calling the ambulance for something. But it had an, um, remarkably sharp stairs. 
of metal. And when we threw people out, oh, you'd wonder how no one got killed. They'd be flung down the stairs. Um, there was one funny incident. There was a guy being dragged down the stairs. He was thrown to another doorman at the bottom of the stairs who then catapulted him on to Neville. He shouted Neville, like, throw him out. And he, what it was, Neville was coming out of the office and he closed the door, glass doors, and he fired him straight through the glass doors, obliterated the place. <laughs> but after Tony did that to me, I had a decision to make, work for him, and I just exploded on the two of them and stormed out. And then I realized I don't have a job. But at the, John King, then your mate, he um, asked me to come and set up the door in Zen's. And at the same time, then I was offered a secret store, which was also in Romford. It was a competition for them. Two Greeks owned it. A Greek guy called Chris George owned Hollywood Romford. And Savas, Chris Tadulo, owned it secrets. And there were big time competition, two Greeks as well. And he offered me that, but I could pick my own door team and set up my own security company. So I said to John, look, I'll set up Zens. And I worked down there for three months, got the door running and once it was set, I left. And I opened Secrets. And then I continued Secrets, then. that was the one in Ilford, wasn't it? No, Romford. Oh, Romford sorry. Uh, smaller clubs, half, I didn't really want to go there first on, because it was half the size of Hollywood's. Um, over, they were planning to be an over 30s nightclub, which wasn't, it ended up being over 25s, but I liked the guy, the Greek guy, when I met him, and I thought, yeah, I can build from this. So I got that, it was only a six man door, I took five of them from, from Hollywood, was the best of them that were left. But like, over the years, a lot of the doormen had disappeared, the robbery had happened, and of course, everyone knows, like, Three of them went down for that. The murder happened. Three more doormen went down for that. So the best of the doormen that I started with were now gone. I took what was left. Lee Chapman moved on up to run Hollywood and Ipswich. And the, what was left are the ones that Tucker could order around, you know. The rest of us didn't want to work for him. And from there on then, we, went, we were in competition for doors in Romford. Um, because I, I I hated him for a while. Yeah. Because I just I was just shocked really. I hated myself for being so stupid. But I really hated him. But it it, it in hindsight we we became friends afterwards because I realised it was the best thing ever happened to me. I would have stayed on his head dormant there for the next ten years and I would have gotten nowhere. Yeah. Whereas it forced me to go out, set up on my own and actually be the front man and take responsibility and start getting doors one by one and that's a whole different ball game then because you're dealing with gangsters then you're dealing with other door teams that want your doors and you're more up front and it's more dangerous but it was the life i wanted and i loved it and tucker loved it too he got a lot of doors fairly quickly yeah and he would have got as big as i did in the end if he had just stuck at that but the rave scene came and again they bought a club called Club UK in Wandsworth um, for this new rave music because they were coming in from the fields now the police were breaking them all up so yeah. they said you got to come into the club so they started setting up in and I think a lot of the punters wanted warmer clubs and they wanted a bit more atmosphere you know? so when they bought Club UK we bought Club UN in Tottenham and that was competition and we'd be hiring the same promoters. Kerry Stone, who's, who plays Tucker in the films, was actually a promoter of One Nation. Yeah, a big one. He was a big promoter. He had a One Nation. Um, it was a good outfit, well-run outfit. Um, and did put on events in our place and in Club UK. And that's how he knew Tucker as well, and he had met him. Uh, and then that was that was that was wild because we were in Tottenham and that that was a crazy place, but the rave scene was something else. Like the first one I did was a happy hardcore night, and I had uh, twenty doormen on, and I sent sixteen of them home. Sixteen. Yeah, we didn't need them. There was, everyone was just smiling, yeah. coming up hugging us, and everything. What is wrong with these people? 
Is this like when the E's come in? Just, that type of right at the beginning, and it was yeah, and there was no violence. There was none of that. It was just E's. And the difference between just these and the later years was that everyone was happy. No one could get angry. So there was never any problems, you know. But ease became expensive. They were hard to get in from Holland. There was a lot more police presence. So the price of them went right up to something like 25 pounds a pill. And that brought in the gangsters. Like, why rob a bank? When you can sell these or rob the, you know, rob, rob a rave, and that's how Carlton got started. He, he was brought in as protection for the the field raves before they came to the clubs, and then he followed into the clubs, and then he set up his own security company in East London. And as everyone knows, he met Tony, and they sort of became partners. They helped each other out rather than they didn't join up as one company or anything, but they they helped each other out, and I helped. Eat both of them at various times with, with providing guys if they were short and things like that. The difference was is I, I was now making huge amounts of money because all raves needed vast amounts of door staff. The clubs were always expanding. You needed more and more men. He, Tony, discovered pills and the money that was involved in pills and quickly just decided, you know, I can make more money at this, and this is the route he wanted to take. And that's the decision he made, you know. Lots of other people made that decision and never got hurt or never got killed and got wealthy from it. Um, the providers, usually the, the biggest gangsters in Essex that are always talked about, they usually provided the drugs for others to sell. Never really got involved with the messy bits, yeah. you know. So well, what time, when you first sort of met Tony Tucker, was he not involved with um, Pat Tate and Craig in them days, or did you mm. stumble across him as well? No, when, when we first started in Hollywood, it was 87. Tony was just out of a divorce, didn't have a lot of money, worked the doors. He was a nice guy, we had fun. He, had, he, he was quiet, but he had a, a quiet sense of humour. But he was always involved, every row he was there, you know, he wasn't afraid to fight or anything. He never took a pill because to be honest when we, in 87 there was no pills mm. they were still out in the fields and we weren't involved in that they started to creep in around 89 or um, yeah 89 90 they got more into the clubs then um, he didn't discover pills really until 93 when he opened Club UK and then it was right there in his face and the money was made uh, before that he never got involved in it um, so because he was a party guy, at this stage, you know, he was working with Nigel. Nigel Ben was um, a cousin of one of the doormen in Hollywood, so he used to always come down there. And we all worked various boxing events with him and whatever. But he was a party guy, a big, big party guy, and Tucker bought into that, so Tucker would always go with him, and they became friends. And he lost his focus. The lifestyle was better than how, you know. Reality. Yeah. yeah. So where he was on a track to make money legitimately, he just got veered off. Because what happens is, the one thing, I, the reason I stopped helping out Nigel and that, was he had so many hangers on and spivs, just sucking up, you know, trying to either live off his limelight or earn money out of him somehow, you know. Yeah. Um, when he fought Michael Watson, was the last fight I worked with him, uh, myself and a guy called Lloyd Day, was a good friend of Nigel's, we were at the fight. Um, we were suited up because we were supposed to be working, but they did some sort of, I can't remember, they did some old intro where the police walked them in. They weren't really police, but they were dressed as police yeah. or something, so it was some old thing, because it was a Brit big British fight, so there was all this pizzazz. So that, so we didn't go in with him, we just watched the fight. <clears throat> but when he lost, we brought him back into, because he was emotional, we got him out of the ring and brought him back into the, his dressing room. Every single one of them abandoned him. There was nobody in the room. It was just like this room here now. No one. You, you can't get it. The other booth was just there 
15 feet away and you couldn't get into it. Everyone wanted to know the winner, Watson, because yeah. he was now clearly now going to be the new golden boy. And Ben was finished. Didn't work out that way. But that was the plan. And I've never seen anything like it. You know, I mean, you'd hear stories of, of old time um, boxing in America and the spivs that hang around it. They hang around it here too. Now, Mindy, Ambrose Mindy was, was um, Nigel's manager. He based himself on Don King, Flash, yeah. Diamante Jackets, Big Cigar, biggest spiv of them all. He abandoned Nigel and went to go out in his car and he was cursing him out and screaming because his big payday had gone. So I went out and we had a row and I gave him a slap outside and he got into the car and that was it. Never, he was, he was done with Nigel. Um, I think the freighters came on afterwards. But uh, I hated all that scene. It was just scumbags after scumbags involved in it at the time, you know. Same with the with the the bare knuckle scene. Like when I first came to England, I had a, a load of because I was I was fighting for years. I had over a hundred fights before I got to England. This is on the straight now. Yeah. Uh, so the the kings in Canvey had a ring. You could go there any day, Saturday and Sunday, and get in and fight. And you'd pay you a couple hundred quid, or you could. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like it was unlicensed in every sense, but it was in a ring. That's the nearest they got to you. So a bit like the. So when you when you turn up, do you just get an opponent on the night, or you if they could, they'd, they'd match you with someone. Yeah, if someone wanted to fight. Or usually, what it was was I have a problem with you. Yeah. You have a problem with me. Rather than fight the street, it's a bit dangerous. We'll set it and we'll throw a few bob in the side and have the bet. And, and then there was a ref, so there was some sort of control. But like I fought guys, and they were either drunk or they were fat or they were too skinny. It just it was rubbish, and there was no money in it, so I didn't do it. Um, and on th even, I just did door work for money because yeah. I worked the buildings when I when again and I had no real f idea of what I wanted to do you know I did some sparring um, but it wasn't I wasn't big enough to be a boxer and I wasn't good enough because I was a, I was a kickboxer or karate and kickboxer so it's not the same you don't have the same hands as a, a pro boxer and I just wasn't big enough. Sixteen stone. That was the time the big guys came. Yeah, you know. Sort of like they use at the bottom end of the heavyweights. Yeah, you know, the bottom of the bottom of the end. But yeah, all you'd be using. I I I met other sparring partners, and that's like their profession. You know, they're professional sparring partners, and it's a horrible game because you get maybe fifty times more punches than you do as a boxing career because you're in there every day getting your head belted off yeah. by somebody. No, it wasn't for me. So I got into the security, and the first chance I got to set up my own door team, I thought, that's how I make money. That's how I do. But then you have to deal with the gangsters, and they come thick and fast. Um, and I was doing a good job on it, and I wasn't involved in drugs, so the police noticed that, and they started putting me up for doors. And I got the Berwick Manor, which was closed down due to drugs and violence. Um, it was run by a gangster called Terry Marley all over um, East London from Barking Up, like that was their thing. He was part of the, the Canning Town crew that had moved out into Essex and that was his area yeah. from Cranham and Upminster. Uh, but that was their base and the police said to me, look, we want to open it up. It's now opening up again as a, as a rave club um, as opposed to what it was before, an old ballroom with romance type of thing, you know, for the drinkers. So the first night we had this DJ, or this uh, promotion in, and I said, "Look, see this bar here. I want bass speakers from the floor to the ceiling, and I don't want anything less than ninety decibels coming out, because I knew they were going to come, and that was their haunt into the bar." And as they sent down one guy, and oh, the poor guy, he was—we knew, we saw him coming, big beer belly. He wasn't a raver by any stretch of the imagination. We even got a pint, and he was standing there like this, you know, the, the rhythm was going through the thing. Um, and then Marley's brother came down in paint trousers and tried to come in and I ended up beating him up and throwing him out and then we got threatened by Marley and everything else and I had to solve that and you're always dealing with these wannabe gangsters baby gangsters shootings on the door stabbings on the door there was always something 
Was was a lot of it to do with you running the club, sort of rivalry, or them trying to use the club as their sort of domain? Well, that, no, that particular one, the Big Manor, was that was their domain, and I was keeping them out of it. Right. But in general, it was usually they wanted to put drugs to it. Like when we had Club U and in Tottenham, that was only a mile from where the Adams were based. That was their whole area. And ironically, a couple of my friends worked for them doing different jobs um, but they wanted to put drugs through the thing and I wouldn't have it and we used to bash up all the little dealers we'd find and and what happened was then we'd find shootings and stabbing someone would come down and just let a gun off at the door or stab someone inside because they just they wanted to keep causing trouble until we yeah. back down but I wouldn't back down and uh the Yardies came down one night, they had a big event on, there must have been a hundred of them, they burst through the front of the queue and came in and we couldn't keep them out really, we were just trying to manage it, but we couldn't and it kicked off and we had a riot on the front door, probably the worst fight in my life, it was just extreme to the extreme, they were handing out knives outside ready to attack the door, uh, we had coshes and mag lights. I took a chain off, off the door that used to lock the doors. Big, thick chain with a with a, a wretch lock at the end of it. And as one of the, the head of the yardies ran through the door at me with a blade, I hit him over the head with a chain and he hit me there. And he cut me from there all the way down to there. Right through the face, the face opened up. But the jacket saved me. The jacket was a uh, MA2 jacket and it, the top part opened, but it was all that, you know, that fake wool inside. It yeah, stopped yeah. the blade, the Stanley knife cutting me, and the blade broke in, in my zip. And it was a vicious, vicious fight. Absolutely vicious fight. Three or four of us got stabbed. One of them got hit with a hammer. One of the doormen got a hold of a hammer and hit one of them and put him into a coma. The police wouldn't come across the road because they didn't want to get involved in a white on black violence from the police. They left the two of us. And it went on for over half an hour. Bloody hell. Mm. So there was it's nights like that. For like, survival, yeah. Yeah, I, I was out for maybe two weeks. But uh, got stitched up and was back. And I was in another row then where it kicked off again. Probably one of my best fights. There was only two of us on a pub door. I shouldn't have been there, but someone didn't turn up, so I said I'd cover it. And I kicked off with these 10 guys. And all around the dance floor was the old fashioned railings like a stairs. Yeah. So the first guy to hit it, which was probably me, broke it. And then all the spindles fell down. So we're picking them up and then using them as weapons. <laughs> it was chaos. And then a guy picked up a glass ashtray, the old heavy ashtrays. Yeah. You don't see them anymore. Oh, yeah, back in the day, yeah, yeah, with the spikes where you could put the cigarette yeah, in the yeah. spike and he threw it and I turned into it and it hit me right there and obliterated my eye and blinded me. So these are the type of things you got. Um, in fact, your, your, your podcast is advocating for a guy to be released from prison, Mark Osborne. Mark Osborne, yeah, yeah. Mark Osborne, you can cut this later on if you want, I don't care detestable little scrote. Mark Osborne came to Opium front door one night and emptied a pistol at, at the doorman in the front door. He hit three cars, doorway on the side and two windows above. Couldn't hit the barn door with a banjo if a wound. But that was the type he was and we then hunted him down for a month. He got arrested by the police because the police caught him and wanted those to be witnesses and everything else. And Terry Marley arrives back on the scene, ringing up saying, Where son, go so he sad. Trying to pay a thousand pounds to get it out. So I mugged him off, told him where to go. He had forgotten who I was, so I reminded him. I said, I'm not dealing with you, you idiot, go away. So then he got Terry Adams. Terry Adams rings me, fellow Irishman, blah, 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 we can sort this out. I said, there's no sorting it. The poor young fellow that he aimed for, has already given a statement to the police. He can't turn around and say, say otherwise, you know. Ironically, he got off, uh, which was a pity, really, because a year later then, 
he stabbed someone, one of his friends, and put him into a coma and got sent to jail. And then, of course, there's your case then. While he was in jail, he was, he was allegedly involved in a murder with his brother. Um, but these are the characters you got in this. So, you know, they didn't have to be high-end gangsters. There was the, the wannabes too. Sons of gangsters, all of this. I mean, there's the famous case at the time where a doorman called Ronnie Fuller was um, shot dead over on uh, Epping Forest. And what happened was a fight went off. A guy pulled a knife in this melee. He took the knife off him and he stabbed him and he killed him. And that guy was uh, Pierman was his name. He was Ronnie Pierman's son. And Ronnie Pierman was a gangster over in Canning Town, one of the one of that main crew, you know, the old style gangsters. And for a month, it was funny, all of Essex knew about it, all the Dorman knew about it. He had said, hand yourself in and admit to, to murder and you'll survive. And Ronnie wouldn't do it. Um, and he wasn't charged by police either, which was a pity really, something wasn't done. Because then the father organized his hit and he was killed on his own front door, shot dead. Uh, yeah. And he never left. Ronnie was too bullheaded. He wouldn't leave. He wouldn't even move out for a month or two, you know. He just well, kept coming, tried to come to work, tried to go home. So it was a dangerous place. It was always volatile, you know, in between. When I say, you know, I might have 50 stories, but that's over 20 years, you know. Yeah. You'd have two extremely violent events in a year and another... 20 there and nothing special the rest of the time was fun you know we had some great acts in there um take that all of these played in the, in, in hollywood it was amazing the the bands they brought big soul bands from from america um we had a meeting once to to get uh, janet jackson to sing there but it was too expensive but they actually discussed it i was there at the meeting to discuss it you know um so it was exciting times that way. It wasn't just all violence, you know. Yeah. Like, there's, no, there's no pretending it wasn't, you know. It was there was a lot of great times, a lot of good people, um, beautiful women. Like Essex really had them, <laughs> and it was the time everyone was free and open. When the everyone had a soft top, <laughs> XR three I. Even I had one. I bought into it. Had a red, red XR three I. Um, that was just a thing at the time, you know, and everyone was high energy and everyone was, a lot of nice people in Essex. I mean, I'll still say to this day, they're salt of the earth. I prefer them to the Hertfordshire crowd because I thought the Hertfordshire crowd they were very polite and everything else, but you could see behind their eyes probably don't like you, but they wouldn't be too polite to say it. But the Essex crowd, you knew, yeah. you know what I mean? He cursed yeah. you out or he told you he loved you in equal measure. That was the way Essex was. Um, still is I'm sure okay Michael we've rounded it up there so um, thanks for coming there's been some great stories in there you're welcome and uh, we'll have you back for a part two thank you very much thank I will you, Michael. you're welcome <laughs>